What's up guys and welcome back to my Better Call Saul reviews. Probably going to be next week when I get to my season five review for those of you that have asked, but we are back talking about the final season and we are now at episode six titled Axe and Grind. One more episode for the first half of the season, which will debut next week. Then we take a couple of weeks break, a month or so, and then we come back for the final six, seven episodes of this season. And thus far, I've seen a lot of criticism thus far of this season as a whole being slow and being a little bit drawn out and really taking a methodical pace to set things up. And I really have not had an issue with that. You know, Better Call Saul has been a show that has taken that approach more times than not, especially in the first two seasons. When you have something that's attached to a show like Breaking Bad that, in my opinion, just kind of hit the ground running and with very few exceptions was pretty much on that pacing the entire way through the show and just continued to ramp up, Better Call Saul is much more deliberately paced. You know, they have a lot of times where they're setting things up, they're meticulous, they're taking their time, especially in the first couple seasons, finally getting to that Breaking Bad story style tone that we first got introduced to, in my opinion, in season three. And so this hasn't really been out of character for me. You know, with the exception of episode three thus far in these six episodes, they've been more slow about setting things up, about building towards whatever's going to transpire in the last half of the season, building towards the little ties that they have to create to where we find Saul in the beginning of Breaking Bad in season two. And so there's a lot of things that they have to take their time with. And this is another one of those episodes, a little bit more slow, a little bit more methodical, a little bit more thought provoking, not really a big action packed episode. Uh, which I kind of was expecting, actually, whenever it said that it was directed by Giancarlo Esposito, I guess because his character is just so dynamic that I figured this was going to be one of the more exciting episodes of the season. But uh, it was, again, one of those more thought-provoking episodes, with the exception of almost a borderline horror scene with Lalo that I'll talk about. But I did like this episode, uh, and I think that it really did build a lot of intrigue for what is going to happen next week. If I'm to assume this first half is all about setting up their plans to take down Howard Hamlin and to take down this sandpiper thing and get the settlement early. And then the back half of this season is all going to be the fallout from that. I think it's all going to be downhill after this midseason finale. And for all of these slower, more methodical and set up episodes that we've had in the first half, I think the last half is probably going to be on a pacing level similar to the final season of Breaking Bad. But we shall see. The episode opened up with a really interesting cold open that showed Kim as a young girl, like a preteen age, and she's being held in this department store for shoplifting. And the mom comes in, which we've only seen in one other cold open where she's obviously not a very good mom. She was a drunk and forgot Kim at school. So now we pick up back with that. And it starts off and seems on the surface that her mom is doing the typical parent thing when you have a kid that gets in trouble, is that you're berating them, you're trying to scare them into doing things the right way from then on. And then quickly it becomes clear that either Kim and her mom were working together so that her mom could steal these things, or the mom just really didn't give a shit and was fine with it and almost was proud of Kim for trying and as a reward stole the things that she was accused of shoplifting in the first place. So I was a little unclear which of those it was, but regardless, it sets up the fact that not only what we already knew didn't have a very good relationship with her mom, but it shows maybe a bit of a foreshadowing that eventually her moral compass is going to steer her the other way, where she is starting to get deeper and deeper into these schemes, into this illegal activity with Saul, and eventually, maybe, there's going to be something to where she's going to have that mindset she had as a kid where she's just kind of emotionally spent and will choose not to do it anymore. Still very intrigued with where Kim is going to go in this season. I think that she's going to be the focal point of tragedy if I had to assume. So I liked the opening with that. I thought it was interesting to tie more into her character. And they also showed the license plate on the back of her mom's car as saying Nebraska, which is where Saul has relocated. And so I'm not sure if that's foreshadowing that whenever we do finally catch back up with the flash forward segments, the black and white segments of the show, that maybe Kim is eventually going to reunite with Saul. I'm not sure, but it seemed awful deliberate that they put Nebraska on the license plate. Like I've said before, Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad never does anything on accident. And we also got to catch up with Howard Hamlin in his home life. We get to see his wife in the inside of his house for the very first time. And this was a really sad sequence. Now, he's a complicated character because I think that there's things about him that I get is very unlikable and there's things about him that's absolutely insufferable and just seems like this douchebag that you would never want to work with or be around. 
And then there's other aspects to him to where I think that he has good intentions, but maybe is just a little bit clueless about the way to go about them. And he's certainly done some things to earn a bit of the hate, more so from Kim than Saul. But he's a character that I think all of us can agree, whether we like him or not, does not deserve the level of hatred and the level of scheming that uh, Saul and Kim are putting against him. And this scene kind of just encapsulated all of that to where he's very clean and methodical. He's doing his morning routine and he's making this little latte for his wife, which you can clearly tell off the bat is basically a loveless marriage. And she takes this work of art latte where he made the peace sign and everything and just dumps it in a to-go container. And just the look on his face where he's just like, fuck, bitch, I made, I've spent so much time on that thing. And the saddest part of all of it, you know, he's trying to get these plans together where maybe him and his wife can do something together. She clearly just kind of dismisses it. I'll do it by myself. I'll do all of this. And so they're not like angry. They're not hatred towards each other. But like just the quiet, the, the lovelessness is just tangible in this scene. And when she leaves... And he just walks over with this little towel and just cleans up the little bit of latte that she spilled. It was just so sad. And that's just such a good representation of how the writing and the direction, uh, just the way that the team works on this show can make something so small and subtle and insignificant like that really powerful. There's also a bit of a setup slash Easter egg with the veterinarian, the guy that's doing a lot of the medical work for all of the Albuquerque criminals. And he's getting ready to retire, if you will, and move away and get out of this criminal life and hands the little black book with all of his criminal um, ties, all of the people that he has acquaintances with to Saul and to Kim. And they have that little card that's like, you know, best quality vacuum, which obviously is Robert Forster uh, and the, the whole vacuum service that both Saul and Walter White used to get a change of identity, possibly even Kim too, we'll see. But again, cool little Easter egg that was mostly there just for the fans to tie things together for where things are gonna be and give a little context to how Saul knows about this obviously very secret practice that Robert Forster is using in this vacuum store. So that's awesome. And uh, we have the sequence in this episode that is probably the most standout sequence for me, which was Lalo showing up at this construction worker. I think his name was Casper. He's one of the people that worked underneath Werner in season four. And it's the most action-packed sequence that we've had since episode three, but uh, maybe even episode two. But also it was almost like horror-like. <laughs> it was the most graphic sequence that we've gotten in a while, we could say that. And I thought Giancarlo Esposito did a great job at directing this to where very quickly Lalo kind of loses the, the upper hand in the fight. And then you get this great shot where he's holding up this card where he's explaining why he's been there and the camera pans around and you see that he's got a razor blade behind it and he uses it to cut the guy's face, grabs the ax and then just defoots him. <laughs> I, had to, I had to turn it back and watch it again because it happened so fast. I was like, how did he lose his foot? But uh, that was pretty nuts. And so now this guy is in a tourniquet and he's going to probably give Lalo all the information that he needs regarding this construction site, which again, I, I think is going to be the big uh, element of explosiveness that we're going to get probably in the back half of this season is when Lalo finally knows what Gus has been up to and uh, very intrigued on how all that's going to go because in uh, season two of Breaking Bad, Saul still assumes that Lalo is alive, so I don't know if Lalo lives through this season or if he dies and nobody realizes that he dies because Gus would obviously want that to be kind of uh, uh, undercover, under wraps, would not want anybody to know that. Maybe he's buried underneath the, the floor that becomes that underground meth lab. We'll see, but that was a really cool sequence that stood out in this episode. We didn't get a whole lot with Mike. Uh, it's just a tender moment with him and his granddaughter. He has this little bit of a tiff with Tyrus, who has always been the biggest douchebag that works for Gus ever since season four of Breaking Bad. And uh, I guess for understandable reasons, he's like, so why do we have all these resources allocated to your granddaughter's house? And Mike, for obvious reasons, will not compromise on that whatsoever. He's like, no, until this motherfucker is found or we can verify that he's dead, we're not taking the detail off of my granddaughter. And so he's across the street watching her when they have this little phone call. Uh, just, again, reinforcing something that we already know with Mike, which is that his granddaughter and his daughter-in-law, that's his only purpose in life at this point, is just to make sure that they're safe and that they're secure. And finally, the big element that the episode leaves, which is going to probably be tied into whatever happens in the mid-season finale, which is you have these photographs. Howard Hamlin has hired somebody, this private investigator, to follow Saul, and he's got these photographs that he has set up where he's meeting with this mediator or this judge that's in charge of the Sandpiper case, and it's an actor. And we see later on in the episode that he's filming something with this actor, 
and you get to the end when everything seems to be going fine. They called it D-Day. You got um, Kim that's going off to this little nonprofit charity where she's very happy to be involved with Ed Begley's character. And Saul finds out in the liquor store that the mediator that this guy he is paid to impersonate has a broken arm. And so all of the evidence that he has created, all the false evidence that he has created, is now mute. It's now void. And so he panics and he calls her and she panics and turns around and comes back, leaves the charity event and, and goes back to make sure that they can get all this done on the day that they were anticipating instead of taking Saul's advice of let's abort and we'll come back to this another time. And so I'm not 100% sure, nor do I think that they want any of us to be 100% sure what exactly the plan is. You know, there's something that they've been piecing things together and we're going to see how that all fits together in a good or a horrible way in the mid-season finale. But certainly interested on what exactly their plans are because it seemed at first very obvious we're just going to tear down the reputation of Howard Hamlin so that his case is compromised and these people are more willing to settle faster than they would have and then Saul can get his money but now it looks like there's a lot of other elements there's a lot of turning cogs in this wheel that um, is going to all come to some explosion in the next episode whether that's in their favor or most likely not in their favor. So very intrigued to see where things go in this mid-season finale. And uh, I'm sure it's gonna be the most entertaining episode of the season thus far. So all in all guys, again, I like this episode. You know, th there hasn't been any gigantic standout episodes. There's certainly a standout sequence in episode three, but this season has been building towards what I would assume is the better half of the season, the more exciting half of the season. But I have enjoyed the ride thus far. This episode was no exception to that. So if you guys enjoyed this review and recap, please click over here for the rest of my Better Call Saul reviews. And I'm also gonna put my ranking of the Breaking Bad seasons here if you're a fan of that show as well, which let's be honest, you are. Please like and share this video and hit the subscribe button. And as always guys, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean that you have to be.